Good morning, good morning. Welcome back to Garden in Place. I'm Roger Gray, a volunteer with the University of California Cooperative Extension Master Gardener Program. This is our uh, one of a series of regular workshops about how to grow food at home, especially uh, started during this COVID emergency. Um, welcome everybody. We have several uh, topics on tap for you today, ranging from working with kids to uh, setting up your fruit tree orchard to um, how to grow peanuts. I'm looking forward to the peanuts, honestly, because uh, I've, I've been trying since I was a kid, so that'll be fun. Um, before we dive into that, though, I do want to uh, touch base with everybody about a topic that has been on a lot of folks' uh, minds. It's come up in Facebook posts uh, quite a bit, and that is, uh, what kind of effect is the fire going to have on your vegetable garden? And there are two answers to that. The short version is uh, probably nothing much. Um, it turns out they've done a lot of research about the effect of ash fall on things like heavy metals and contaminants in the soil and that sort of thing. And as far as the plants that you can eat and the soil, for the most part, it is not an, uh, a consequential event. It does not create a lot of heavy metals. It does not create a lot of um, difficulty with the soil. The one thing that ash does tend to do is it is, uh, uh, makes the soil slightly more alkaline. And with uh, a lot of ash, it will make it slightly more alkaline. Depending on where your soil started, that may not be a bad thing. Uh, it also does bring some nutrients that be, are, are released only through the burning process. So in general, it's an acceptable uh, uh, amendment itself to your soil. Now, if you have concerns, what is generally recommended is to, once the fire has settled down and the ash has settled in, do a soil test. Uh, we recommend several places, including the University of uh, Massachusetts at Amherst, the, the $20 soil test, um, or maybe it was 25, I lost track, but it's inexpensive and it, they tell you all about your heavy metals. Uh, the biggest problem is the airborne matter that gets in your lungs. So if you're outside gardening while the active ash fall is there, you want to make sure you cover up. And also, if you are using leaf blowers or other types of things, uh, or even rakes or shovels, you can stir up ash, which then also gets into your lung. So the important piece is to water that ash in and possibly rinse off your plants because it's like any other dust. It's not good for the plants to plug their pores. Uh, but for the most part, chemically speaking, there's nothing too tragic about it. In a moment, once uh, we get started with um, uh, Master Gardener Joan, we will put uh, some links up in the chat that have half a dozen links to all the studies I've referenced, several um, very deep and dense uh, scientific studies they did through the University Cooperative Extension, and also a webinar. If you actually live in one of the affected zones, if you've actually got ash on your, your food and your growing food, uh, this webinar is for you. Uh, if you're not in one of those zones, they're asking you to watch the video later. Uh, but again, that link will show up in the chat in just a moment. Um, all right. Uh, once again, if you have questions about this or any other thing, feel free to go ahead and put them over in the chat. You'll also see links there as we go along. Meanwhile, time to hear from Master Gardener Joan, because I know school has started and a lot of you are locked up in your house with your kids, trying to get them to do their classwork online, and it probably isn't the whole day and you need things to do to save your sanity and theirs. Joan? Hi, everybody. Yes, this is true. Uh, now, as you know, if you've been with us since the beginning or somewhere in the middle of our gardening in place workshops, you know that our focus is on uh, gardening under quarantine. And some of you who have children at home may be wrestling with um, trying to keep your children engaged and becoming teachers as well. And we want you to, to be encouraged to use your garden as an outdoor classroom, either specifically as a classroom or as a break from uh, the routine of sitting in front of a computer. And you can support their school, their school work by taking advantage of the garden that you have or whatever you have, whatever nature is out there. So, here I have some information for you. Let's see what I can help you with. Now we know they need to get up and move around. Sometimes they, they become antsy and they don't want to sit in front of the computer. Either way, um, 
get them outside or even just start looking at your house plants and ask them what they notice about their plants, the, the plants. Uh, and you may even find some bugs, whatever. Just start it as, use it as a conversation starter and uh, engage all their senses. Ask them to describe the colors they see, for instance, or the different leaf shapes. And um, this sounds silly, perhaps, but it's a really be good beginning to engage them. Now, what are you growing in your garden? Now, for instance, show them or have them show you the different parts of the plants that we eat. Now, here's a, here's a chance where you can really impress your kids or have them roll your eyes, but it doesn't matter. Roll their eyes at you, but it doesn't matter. Now, for instance, we know as gardeners that we, eat, we cultivate different plants to eat different parts of them. So start saying, hey, look at that plant there. What part do you think we eat? Well, I know I'm growing this one because I like this lettuce leaf. But I know that, hey, see that stalk growing? It wants to produce seeds, so I'm going to remove it. Ha ha, you can really wow them. Or not, I know it's true. But really show off what you can, um, show off your knowledge. And then have them reflect on what they notice out there and have them share their ideas and their observations. Also what's going on in your garden, you can have them tell you what their favorite and least favorite vegetables and fruits are, and they can start to get a good idea of perhaps what they would like to grow in the garden. And maybe you found or they've discovered some seeds that are growing in your garden that they can collect and start to germinate. Now we have some other ideas for you. These are very, very basic, it's true. You can start to create an observa observation kit for them, such as grab pencils and paper and uh, cut a piece of cardboard and with some rubber bands attached or new clothespins attach some paper and they can be sleuths and they can start to take notes. They can start to take, draw pictures. They can start to create a journal. And um, you can also grab all of your seed packets and plant markers from the plants that you have grown in your garden and they can start to relate relate the information on the seed packets and the plant tags and they fight such as what the colors are what the plants are if they if they're performing the way you expected or that the information matches up and they can start to make predictions and you see i even threw seed catalogs in there i have used seed catalogs working with nursery school and uh, uh, kindergarten age children for instance if nothing else, they can just look through and be, look through them and enjoy the pictures. Maybe they can cut them out and paste them. Maybe they can start to plan their own garden. And um, I just find C catalogs to be a wonderful, a wonderful teaching tool with children. Especially maybe if you're getting C catalogs, maybe you keep getting the new ones. Give your old ones to the children. Or I know many people maybe don't want to. Um, encourage paper and are just using online seed catalogs, I still say send away for the free ones for your children. It's a great resource. Now you have to remember also that children's priorities in the garden are different from adults' priorities. Now, especially really young children, they really may want to just dig, fill up a bucket, pour it out, dig, fill up a bucket and pour it out. Well, let them do that. That's a sensory experience for them and they need to do that. Now, for instance, you may have uh, also another, for instance, you may have a showcase area in your garden that you prefer your children don't dig up. Well, 
make sure that they have their own pot, for instance, or their own area in the garden where they can just dig and do their own thing and look for life above and beneath the soil. And also maybe you, a ch your children may have decided they want to grow something that we know it's not the right season. Let them do it. Just let them have the experience um, and they will learn from that experience almost as much as, well, not as much as, but they will get something out of that experience. So I want to again encourage you let your, get your children outside, even in the bad air. Okay, we don't want them out there that long in the bad air, but that's up for you to decide how much time. But take advantage of your garden uh, for your children who are sitting in front of a computer all day long. Enjoy it. Thank you. Awesome. Um, yeah, absolutely. And remember, folks, if you do have questions or comments, feel free to use the chat. Um, Joan, I know it's kind of interesting. You say give the kids their their uh, some flexibility in there because their priorities are different. In some ways, I found they're the same. Um, small children love to destroy things, at least from the adult's perspective. Have you noticed that? Absolutely, they do, and that's part of their exploration. And yes. um, either it's yes, either their exploration or they need that outlet. So there are so many reasons that you should uh, let your children go dig and explore. Excellent, yes, well, when adults destroy flowers, we call that a dissection. Yes. Yes, <laughs> and um, don't uh, discount, I think, the fact that kids are, are learning about the flower parts as they take them apart, because you see the pieces that are normally quite hidden. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank um, you. And coming up next, we have uh, Master Gardener Herb, who is going to talk to us about uh, a continuing saga in the orchard, how to do battle with the bad bugs uh, without doing battle against the good bugs. Um, the basics of IPM for the orchard. Herb? Thank you, Roger. Well, we've had uh, a couple in the series of uh, IPM for the backyard orchards and we'll continue. Uh, last time we, we showed some simple measures you can take for uh, protecting your trees. And today we're going to move along to protecting your beneficials. And that reminds me to, to say that the, the distinction between beneficials and pests is really quite artificial. And we should begin thinking in a more ecologically sound way. The pests really are vegetarian insects. Those that eat fruit, uh, those that eat leaves and shoots, Whereas the beneficial insects are the carnivores, the meat-eating insects that eat other insects. So we make this arbitrary distinction, uh, which depends on what we're trying to accomplish in our gardens. Uh, we've used the term uh, ecosystem quite a bit, and, and you should know that that's a very specific definition that was uh, first used by uh, uh, in the... Uh, area of, uh, of national parks and Yosemite and uh, Yellowstone. And it was uh, first used by uh, a uh, early ecologist who was trying to instruct the uh, interior department that to protect Yellowstone, you need to consider all the surrounding areas, that there are large herds of bison that come in from the north. There are herds of elk that come in from the south. And he began developing the concept that all of these things work together and you can't make a simple change without affecting all the other residents of the ecosystem. And uh, last time, Lydia had a very nice presentation about the ecosystem that's in the soil, actually what's called the rhizosphere and all the critters that enable the plants to grow properly. So these things work in harmony and actually using chemical uh, elements, the roots communicate with all these creatures in the uh, in its uh, ecosphere to control the pH, control the uh, solubility of minerals, and the same thing is true of the canopy and the rest of the and the rest of the garden and the orchard. So that what we want to do is we want to make very small changes so we don't upset this entire ecosystem because it's in balance. So these measures that we're going to use are ones that that change things a little bit in our favor favor what we call the beneficials over the pests, 
uh, but don't make any dramatic changes and upset the balance. All, all the insects that cause diseases in our orchards are residents. They're part of the orchard. They don't come in from neighbors. They don't come in from across the street. They're living there. The bacteria, the fungi, most of the insects, and they're waiting for opportunities to grow. Uh, so what we want to do is create an environment that keeps them suppressed and allows them some sort of balance. So we're going to go down into the orchard and uh, we're going to uh, consider this question of whether we can use organic methods that are used in organic orchards, whether they be large commercial orchards or small family orchards. And the answer is, of course, we can. And that's what we're designing these little talks to, to do, is to improve your skills in using these methods. So here is a little video down in a community orchard. And uh, we'll start that going. This is the second of the two most important fundamental strategies in the orchard for maintaining your ecosystem which we should explain later on, and effective organically based pest management. And this is the prevention of ants invading your tree and tree canopy. And we can also discuss why that is so foundational and so critical to any organically based uh, pest management strategy. It's the use of Tanglefoot. in combination with borax stakes comes as a self-contained tree care kit which has everything you need to successfully deploy this strategy or you can purchase it in individual containers this is this Asian pear tree and I'm going to protect it against uh, ant intrusion so take a strip of this special corrugated waterproof uh, paper and place it around a smooth section of the trunk. and fasten it in place. Then be sure that any gaps are plugged with cotton balls or else the ants will find a way up underneath your tangle foot strip. Next, using the small wooden applicator or tongue depressor, apply a band of tanglefoot completely around over your protective paper strip. It looks like that before I've even completed this, I've already trapped an ant that was crawling up the tree. But be sure any, any irregularities are plugged, particularly on the bottom, using those bits of cotton balls. The next thing is to put, put one of these taro stakes or other uh, borax stakes at the base of the tree activated by breaking the tab off that frees the uh, liquid bait and place that firmly in the ground at the base of the tree. 
This ensures that when the ants are unable to cross the tanglefoot barrier, they do have a source of bait and material to take back to the nests. The borate isn't uh, toxic to the ants, but once it, it's carried back into the nest, it'll destroy the colony. From time to time, you'll need to renew the tanglefoot because the ants will carry up little twigs and other bridge across the tanglefoot band so that they can then get up into the tree. The ants themselves are not causing any, any problem for the tree, but they farm the aphids that live uh, on the leaves. The aphid's uh, intestinal tract is not very well differentiated, and so it excretes a lot of sugary material, which the ants collect and carry back to the nest. Your beneficial insects uh, try to eat the aphids, but they're protected by the ants, who will kill the young larvae of the surfeit flies and kill the young larvae of the uh, beetles, particularly the lady beetles. So basically, if you see a lot of soot, sooty mold in the tree, and that's that black coating, that's not harmful to the tree, except it's an indicator that the ants and the aphids have set up a very comfortable symbiotic relationship. And in so doing, protect your tree, protect your tree against the protection of the beneficial insects. So this is really a critical step particularly if you're going to try to maintain your orchard in using a, a, an organic system of pest management. So, Roger, that, uh, that's a very simple method, and it's something that you can do with school children. They love to do these sorts of exercises in the orchard or in the garden. It's also an excellent opportunity to describe what happens in this ecology and how you make modifications that enable you to keep your orchard safe uh, from diseases and pests. The other thing about these little techniques is uh, what is often said, the devil is in the details. Uh, I, I've seen people who are experienced, so they say, spraying their trees with chemicals using the wand that comes with the sprayer, which is usually a straight wand for use in the garden or uh, use for weeds, but has nothing to do with spraying trees. So basically they cover the tree and it hits all the top surfaces of the leaves and the insecticide is shed just like water off an umbrella. And the, uh, the, uh, pred the harmful insects, or the pests, are safely protected underneath the leaves where they live, obviously to protect themselves from birds and other predators of the insects. So simple, changes in your technique sometimes are critical in uh, deciding whether you're going to have success or failure. And that's why I mentioned very often people leave gaps around the tree and the ants find that very readily. And then they, then they say, well, this doesn't work. Well, nothing works unless it's done perfectly. <laughs> uh, and that's just the way of nature to, uh, to favor those that do things right. Uh, I can take some questions, Roger, or we can save them to the end, whichever. All right. Well, we um, at the moment, the chat is is shockingly quiet. So I'll remind folks that there um, is a space in there for, for questions or comments if you have them. But um, either we are being tremendously clear this morning, both of us, or um, just a little bit obtuse. I don't know which. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, Herb, I noticed that uh, one of the things about Tanglefoot is, and I love the name of it, um, is that it comes in different different formats you can get the brush on they do have a spray can version um i don't know if that's as as effective but it's a physical barrier and not a poison or a pesticide in any way yeah i think it's the the combination if you just use a tanglefoot 
you're not going to succeed. You have to have a source of debate. That's why ANR recommends that you always combine the two. You have to have a source of bait that they can carry back to the nest. First of all, you don't want to kill the ants there. So you don't want any toxins or poisons because that, that takes care of one ant. And they figure out very rapidly what's not useful to do. Uh, but this way, if you have the, uh, the borate, like the taro steaks, which is a sweet uh, material but, uh, and a harmless chemical, uh, if they can't cross the tangle foot, they'll very rapidly give that up because there's a source of bait right at the base of the tree. And they carry that back to the nest, and that generally destroys the entire nest within a short period of time. So all of these little techniques, and this is something that I think I, I may have mentioned, children love to do, and it's a good way of introducing them to what to insect control rather than having some can with a picture of a skeleton and bones on it. Um, so these details are what are critical in every maneuver in the orchard, particularly if you're going for an organic strategy, which really depends on being proactive. You've got to do all these things before you have a problem, because once a problem begins, using organic methodology, you're very unlikely to reverse it. And then you're, you're left with the real toxic chemicals if you want to clean up things. And also the idea of the ecosystem is you, you need to have some leaves that have holes. You, you got to have a pest there to attract the beneficials. And it's this balance that you want to maintain. Uh, once you upset that, you've set yourself up for a very, very difficult management uh, course. So basically, uh, it, it's very helpful when you go into your garden or your orchard, you consider yourself part of the ecosystem. And just that little change in thinking begins to change your attitude and you become much more successful. And it's a lot more pleasant to engage with all of the creatures that are in the soil and in the air and living all around the, the trees uh, as a participant. And, uh, but you're, a, or a, you're an active participant. You, you shift this balance so it favors the production of food. Uh, organic production is not hands off. You're, you're not leaving it like the forest to let nature take care of it because all of these things we put in our garden are not native to our area. So they haven't built up the genetic ability to develop this equilibrium by themselves. And, and that's the whole idea of intervention. Um, but when we follow what nature instructs, we use agroecology, we combine these two things and make very minor changes and try not to upset the whole system. Awesome. Little now, roundabout I, 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 explanation, but <laughs> go ahead. Well, we, we have um, a couple of quick questions come up, one of which was, can you use the tanglefoot on a small tree? And the question actually says, use it on the soil or the small tree. And uh, obviously, it's a barrier for the tree trunk. But could you use it on a non-food tree like a Japanese boxwood? Yeah, it can be. Uh, you can even use it on a fence post if there's something that the... Uh, that's ecologically significant about that post in the garden if it's around trees, but this will work on any uh, tree where there is, there's some source of food for the ants. Basically, you're trying to protect food trees. So um, normal landscape trees, you'd rather let them uh, fend in the environment for themselves. You don't wanna put things that are too foreign, uh, but if you have to protect them, from ants invading, if there's a lot of aphids or other soft-bodied insects, you can use the same strategy. But just think of it as a mechanical barrier. It's designed for a very specific function, uh, and it's very, very effective because having the beneficials as, as, a, in, as part of the partnership of managing your orchard goes a long way to uh, helping you sustain the health of the orchard and the ecosystem. So it's a small uh, maneuver, but it's very critical in uh, being proactive. Excellent. Well, um, we do have a couple other similar questions, but I don't want to get us off into a long-term pest control for ants in your home kind of moment. Uh, I will point out that if you Google uh, ants 
UCANR, you'll get a lot of really good recommendations for ant uh, control in your home. Um, mostly they're not a problem in the sense that they don't, um, the little black ants, the Argentine black ants uh, don't like you any more than you like them and they mostly avoid people directly. Um, I have a couple of ant baits that I like that are OMRI um, registered. And OMRI stands for Organic Material uh, Research Institute, I believe. But in any case, the things that are labeled that uh, are considered acceptable for organic gardening purposes if used according to the instructions. Uh, and generally, they're fairly uh, low toxicity, low, um, uh, low probability of getting unintended uh, targets. So uh, that's a key to look for, OMRI, if you're uh, going to a different brand or a different kind of product. Awesome. Well, Master Gardener Judy Gomez has been um, helping us out with confessions of a Master Gardener, a brand new Master Gardener for a while. And I've jokingly told her she's not going to be brand new for very much longer. But uh, she still has some interesting things to talk about. And she, she has succeeded in doing something that I have been trying to do successfully since I was a kid. And I'm really jealous. Judy? Good morning, everybody. I am, again, this is episode seven of True Confessions of a New Master Gardener. I was in the class of 2020. We just graduated last May. And today, my true confession is found a peanut, found a peanut, found a peanut just now. My daughter told me, don't sing. Anyway, my true confession today is I had no idea you could grow peanuts in Southern California. So a little bit of history about the peanuts because I really didn't know this, really interesting. It originated in South America about 3,500 years ago, made its way into Africa, made its way back into North America on slave ships in the 1700s and actually was regarded as a food for the poor only until after the Civil War. And the increase in demand was partly due to the great work of George Washington Carver, who actually has been called the peanut wizard and the father of modern peanut industry. So he was a research botanist at the at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama in the early 1900s, and they were actually having a real problem with the boll weevil and cotton crops, which was the mainstay of the South's economy, and he recommended rotating cotton crops with peanut crops, and he changed the face of southern farming and developed more than 300 uses for the peanut, including shaving cream, plastics, cosmetics, and coffee. A lot about him, really, really interesting. So peanuts are grown in these main 13 Southern US states and also in Monrovia, California, which is that big red X because that's my garden in my backyard. Um, you can tell the blue states are minor production states, the gold states are major production states, all in the South basically, but China is actually the largest peanut grower in the world. And there are only four types of peanuts. And here they are here, Runner, Virginia, Spanish, and Valencia. And they're actually used for different reasons. For instance, the runner bean is the primary bean used, I'm sorry, the primary peanut used in peanut butter. And actually, Spanish peanuts, if any of you guys are old enough to remember tin roof sundaes, there's also an ice cream brand, which is a tin roof sundae. Spanish peanuts are used there. So the total consumption by category, 54% of the peanuts grown are used in peanut butter. Again, I thought that was interesting and they are the number one snack nut consumed in the US. Botanically speaking, and I put this a lot of stuff on this slide in case anybody wants to take a picture or goes back in the recording. It's so interesting. Peanuts are an annual legume. They're in the legume family, which is along with chickpeas and soybeans and peas and licorice, clover and lentils. Actually, you can produce 40 or more peanuts from one seed. We're gonna talk about seeds in a minute. And the interesting thing about peanuts is the flowers are above the ground, but the fruits grow underground. And peanuts are not roots, which again, I'll show in a few minutes. So I'll show the yellow flowers, but when they pollinate themselves, the petals fall off 
and the ovary begins to form and a little peg is formed. And this budding ovary is called a peg. And the peg grows down into the soil and the peanut embryo is at the tip of the peg, goes down into the soil and begins to mature into a peanut. So here on the left-hand side, you can see the yellow flower and those tiny little pegs that are starting right here. And then over here, I took a picture of a longer peg, which would normally be down in the soil. And here is where the peanut is actually going to form. So when you plant peanuts, let's go to the right first, how they grow, this is just a little summary here. You see the leaves on top, the little yellow flowers, Here's a peg, which you can barely see in this national peanut board photo. The peanuts grow under the ground, but they are not roots. And I went outside and got some, and I'm going to show you those in a minute. When you plant peanuts, you need raw peanuts, but you actually should use peanut seeds. And you can send away for them. I've never actually seen them in a nursery. But the literature was saying, even if you go to Whole Foods and buy raw peanuts, they may not actually be raw. They may not be roasted, but they may have had some process given to them so that they cannot sprout. So if you're going to try and grow peanuts, buy the seeds because they stay, it takes a long time to grow peanuts and you want to make sure it's really going to happen. So again, there's a lot of information on this slide, but I just wanted to at least have it for you. Peanuts get planted in the spring and they take a long time to grow, as I said before. And they basically require full sun and they're self-pollinating. And what I really didn't know, con true confession, is that peanuts grow very well in containers. And you can see that at the bottom in the right. There's a lot in UC a r about growing peanuts in containers. So if you're just experimenting and you don't want to take up part of your garden or part of your raised bed for four to five months, which I did, then um, give it a try in a container. So I actually used two sources for my, uh, my experimental peanut seeds. And one was Baker Creek heirloom seeds. And here's my catalog. And Joan, when I get my next catalog, this is definitely going to my grandchildren because you are right. There are absolutely amazing pictures in here that they would cut out and glue everywhere. So I think that's a great, great um, suggestion you shared with us. So I got these Schrantz's Deep Black Peanuts right here. You can see they were packed for 2020. They were $4. And I swear to you, there were no more than 15 or 20 peanuts in this package. So this is what they look like. And they're kind of a neat heirloom variety because the peanut is black, but the peanut inside that black little paper is not black. So it's just like on the outside. And again, you can see at the bottom of this, it requires about 125 to 140 days to harvest. That's a long time. So because I planted them and I still had some more room and Baker Creek was out of them, I then went on Amazon and ordered some of these peanut seeds and they actually came from China. And so these were some red peanuts. So you'll see later that I was really growing two different kinds of peanuts. And there were about 20 peanuts in there and uh, $6.88, they came the next day. That was, you know, Amazon Prime is the best in the world. So here's my peanut patch. Over here on the left, we show the small little peanuts. There's not even any flowers on them yet. In the middle picture, they're starting to get a little bit yellow. And this is your, uh, rather than counting days, you can also look for the yellowing. And over here, you can see pegs and flowers. This is the base of one of the peanut clusters over here. So then, and I had a video, and of course I fail miserably at putting videos up here on Zoom because I really wanted to show you how exciting it was to pull up peanuts for my very first time. And I have to tell you that I did invite my grandchildren over and they were in the garden with the pitchforks because you really want to loosen up the peanuts before you just yank them out. And they were equally as excited to pull up these peanuts. So then you have to dry your peanuts. I put them in the garage hanging next to my bike and my beautiful um, extension cord there. Here's more of a close-up. 
they actually make peanuts, which would, wow, peanuts. So after I go to this black screen, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna show you some peanuts. So this is probably gonna get dirt all over the place. So these are the peanuts that I have hanging in the um, garage right now. So there's all sorts of lovely peanuts. I have them hanging this way in the garage only because I noticed that on many of the websites that I visited, but nobody told me why I need to hang them upside down. So I just did. So then let me show you, I opened one of the peanuts and this is the red, that Virginia peanut. And I'm gonna have to put this down and see if you can see them. Can you see these okay? I think so. These are those. And then, oh, I'm sorry, those were the black peanuts. Oh goodness, Judy. These were the red peanuts and these were the black peanuts. <laughs> there. And I actually, of course, had to taste them and you can actually eat them raw from the garden. They recommend you don't eat a whole bunch of them raw, but we of course had to taste them and they were just, just great. So uh, they taste like, kind of like a water chestnut and very, very sweet. Let me see if I can share this again. Okay, so bringing it back home with smoke in Monrovia, peanuts growing in Monrovia, COVID-19 and peanuts. I thought this was actually really, really interesting. Um, right now, you know, there's no baseball fans at the stadium. The, the baseball stadiums where peanuts are, you know, galore, people love peanuts there. And so in-shell peanut consumption in this country is way down. But the, the consumption of peanut butter, the, the sales of peanut butter have absolutely skyrocketed. And I, there's a really interesting podcast um, done by the BBC, but I couldn't find it, but it was referenced in a couple of my, um, a couple of the articles I read and uh, talking about COVID-19 and what it's done to the peanut industry. Really interesting. So we're gonna quickly go through five simple little peanut quiz questions. So you can write in the chat real quickly, how many peanuts does it take to make a 12 ounce jar of peanut butter? A, B, or C? And my friends, I can't see the chat, so I'm gonna count on Roger. A, B, or C? I have three A's so far, including my own. Four. I, so That's far, right. A, seems a to is be. correct. Yep, there we go. A yes. is correct. When you, and you saw how many peanuts I grew. I don't think I grew 540 peanuts in that amount of space to get a jar of peanut butter. So, you know, you need a lot of space to grow peanuts. And there's a lot of farmland in the South given to peanuts. Number two, true or false, an early introduction of peanuts into one's diet can reduce the likelihood of peanut allergies. True or false? I see a, a true. Uh, I see two trues, a false, two falses, three falses, four falses. I see lots of falses. Oh, good. False. Well, I'm going to refer you all to an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that has shown that this is really true, that um, the early introduction of peanuts dramatically reduced the prevalence of peanut allergies, even if the child stopped eating peanuts when they got older. And actually, in Israel, they have a very, very low rate of peanut allergies, and they attribute it to the popularity of bamba, this is new to me. This is a puffed peanut snack that's available in some U.S. grocery stores. So I guess Israel has a very low rate. This is very true. So Google the New England Journal of Medicine and find out more about eating, serving peanuts young. Young children will actually reduce the likelihood of peanut allergies. Number three, true or false, there is actually a word for the fear of having peanut butter stick to the roof of your mouth. Well, I say it must be true. And so far, everybody is um, chiming in with it's got to be true. Got to be true. And it's called arachibutrophobia. And that is the fear of having peanut butter stick to the roof of your mouth. Take that to your next cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> peanut quiz number four. Name one thing you can do with leftover peanut shells. All right. So you have to write a word here now. 
Somebody has, I see about five people with compost and a, a mulch, a couple of mulchers there. Uh, Excellent. Excellent. The, uh, the recommendations were kitty litter, kindling, fireplace logs, mulch, and compost. If you use them as packing material, you are actually helping the environment as they're eco-friendly. I don't know if I actually want to get something in a big package of peanut shells, but I would if I did get them that way, I would go take them out to the garden and put them in my compost. Number five and last one. Name one former U.S. president who was a peanut farmer. And of course, several folks have popped up with Jimmy Carter. Great. Jimmy Carter actually began selling peanuts on the street when he was only five years old. The other one was actually Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and there were probably more, they say, but those are the two that they can actually verify. And lastly, last Sunday, just like two days ago, was actually National Peanut Day. And we missed it by that much. Next time, I will see you for um, episode eight of True Confessions, if I can think of something to confess. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Excellent. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm still jealous because, I, as I say, <laughs> I've tried to grow peanuts ever since I was a kid when we went down through the South and I brought some seeds back. Uh, a quick note, uh, too, actually. Uh, one is that... Um, the Jimmy Carter Home Place is actually a, a, uh, a place you can visit, and they actually have a working peanut farm there, even though he does not own it. I happen to have met the chief farmer there once uh, in a workshop. Uh, and the other thing is, apparently, recently, because of weird things with Amazon and seeds and uh, China, uh, <laughs> Amazon has stopped Chinese uh, imports of seeds temporarily while they sort that whole thing out. But there are other folks offering um, plant material, of course, online. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. So and I'd much. recommend out actually because they're a spring plant. If you're going to think about planting peanuts, even in a pot come spring, start investigating your seeds now. Because as I went on to Baker Creek, they're all sold out of peanut seeds. So do it now. I, I wonder if that's because they wind up eating the seeds if they're not selling. You know, <laughs> There was a question about roasting, and I will say that there are lots and lots of uh, online uh, tutorials about different ways to roast and to salt uh, peanuts. That I have done um, with somebody else's peanuts that they grew, and it's a lot of fun. All right. Well, we are getting close to the top of the hour, but I'm going to take a minute uh, and talk about something myself. Uh, very quickly, sort of the barest of introductions to the concept of native plants. And this is not so much an edible as the concept of something else to do in your yard, uh, because it's coming up on time to plant the native plant season. Not quite yet, but in late fall, um, we'll be there. And so what I would like to do for just a moment is go to um, what I have called the barest of basics with respect to California natives. Um, and one of the reasons that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this is that they're a little different than what we call regular plants. That is the kind we learn about in fourth grade. Those plants have a tendency to be um, East Coast plants because of the way they, uh, they grow. Um, they have a spring season, which is February, March, and April. There is a summer season, which is generally May, June, July. Um, what we call second summer here and everybody else calls fall, uh, August, September, October. And then we start verging into something like winter for November, December, and January. Remember we have your midwinter solstice in the middle of December, your midsummer solstice in the middle of June, and it makes a lot of sense. The, the normal plants or regular plants from fourth grade that we learn about uh, have a spring and summer growing cycle. Certainly a lot of vegetables do. Um, but even your, your average uh, deciduous tree comes into uh, leaf and flower and fruit. Um, for what they call fall, um, plants tend to go dormant in the fourth grade regular plant model, uh, fall color leaves, um, or the plant is done producing and dies back. And then especially if you're in a place that has a real winter, in winter, the plants are either dead if they are um, not perennial, or they go completely dormant. The trees tend to lose their leaves if you're in snow country. Um, 
And, you know, I always felt gypped that we did not have a lot of deciduous trees um, in Southern California. And this model works for a lot of vegetable crops. Uh, you have to have overwinter vegetable crops that don't need as much of the heat or will tolerate uh, going through the winter, not strictly dormant, but semi-dormant or growing slowly. But when it comes to, um, and then the cycle repeats, when it comes to your, your native plants, it's a different process because that second summer, for example, throws things off. And you'll notice that spring and winter on this model are blue because that's when we get our wet season. And summer is generally somewhat dry. And second summer is really dry. Uh, we almost never get anything like measurable rain in August, September, or October, and only rarely in May, June, or July, especially moving on towards July. Um, so with native plants, the cycle is a little different. Um, and you can observe this on the local hills. All you have to do is look up in the wintertime and notice that the hillsides are green. Um, so the native plants have the usual spring and summer sort of cycle. They grow and they grow and they grow. They like that time and it's moist um, and they bloom a lot in February, March, April, May, June, and July. Um, in second summer, native plants tend to continue to grow. They do just fine um, without adding extra water. They do just fine um, once they're established. Um, some plants go semi-dormant because they're trying to conserve water but your perennial plants don't. They just uh, continue right on through the summer being very, very low water use. Now, one of the ways they do that is they have deep roots. Native plants tend to have very deep tap roots. So it takes a while for them to uh, function well until they're fully established in your garden. But once they're established, um, they can go without water most of the summer. And then finally, of course, winter, which is our wet and rainy season. And definitely by November, December, January, even with some snow on the hills, you'll start to see green because the plants are taking advantage of the fact that that's the wet season in our Mediterranean climate. So um, for spring and summer flowers and, and spring and summer growth and plants with natives, our, our ideal planting time is really that second summer, early part of winter, October, November, um, when it's cool enough that the plants don't have to fight for moisture, they're going to get watered in nicely and have a long time to grow nice deep roots. And even then, in the um, first year of, uh, uh, of uh, growing a native garden, it is recommended that folks um, go ahead and, and provide some additional water. But here's the important piece. You kill native plants in your landscape by watering them too much. If you're used to watering your lawn once or twice a week in every, all through the summer, that's gonna kill your Ceanothus. It does not want that water. It does not like having wet roots. It, in its first year, you maybe water once in a month in June, and then you water once in July, and then maybe, maybe once in every three weeks in August to get them established. But after that first year, they've got deep roots. If they've got a good wet winter, you don't want to hit them with water because it upsets them. And that's one of the places that people go wrong when they're dealing with native plants. For example, if you have a California live oak in your lawn, it's not happy if you are watering the lawn. Um, the, the California, the coast live oaks and most of the other uh, evergreen oak trees that are native to our local chaparral do not like to have wet feet, okay? Um, so one of the things that I will do real quickly is um, mention some resources and then we're gonna get right on out of the uh, process. Um, native plants have been popular in Southern California for quite a long time. Back in the 1890s, a, a person named um, Gertrude Lester, who became known later as Lester Roundtree, moved to California from England and Philadelphia and moved to Pasadena. In fact, she lived right across the street from where I'm speaking and hit here in the 1890s for the great big um, uh, poppy bloom that happened up the street on Lake Avenue in a place that now has a street named Poppy Fields. That's all that's left of it. But in any case, she witnessed that and became a lifelong advocate for native plants. All the way through her, her death at 100 in the 70s, uh, she tramped around in the mountains and collected information about native plants to grow in your garden. 
So one of the pieces that you can get if you're interested in doing landscape natives is she has a book called Hardy Californians, and I will post all these in the chat in just a moment, that's in, been reprinted. And this is her uh, peripatetic uh, journey around the state and pointing out plants that would do nicely in gardens and plants which look nice up on the hills, but don't do so well in the gardens. Because a lot of things that uh, work on the hills don't work in the gardens as well. She also had a book called um, Flowering Shrubs of California. These both came out in the uh, mid to late 30s. Uh, and they're fascinating uh, in part because of the language. There was another naturalist that lived in Pasadena as well um, named Charles Saunders, Charles Francis Saunders. And he wrote a book called The Southern Sierras of California. And what he meant was the San Gabriel Mountains right up here. And he tried to make out like he was John Muir. But his big thing was to take all the natives and bring them back to a garden, um, which is now uh, preserved in a, a house that's right there on Lake Street, wedged between an auto parts store and a tattoo parlor. But the house is still there from, from the 20s when uh, Charles Sanders lived there. If you are interested in doing native plants for your garden, I recommend doing some background research. Uh, this book, uh, Plant Life uh, for Southern California from the University of California Cooperative Extension, it's heavy, it's very thick, like a good field guide, it's small. And it runs through different ecosystems to tell you what kinds of plants work together. And that's key. You don't want to plant a redwood next to a um, manzanita because the manzanita does not like wet feet. It doesn't like to have water in its soil all the time. On the other hand, the redwood practically demands to have wet feet. Um, three other books that I'm going to throw at you and then we'll put the text up in the, um, in the chat uh, as recommendations for research. And again, it's just now starting to get to be time to do research. The first one, California Native Landscape, Homeowner, Homeowner's Design Guide to Restoring Its Beauty and Balance by a gentleman named Greg Rubin. Uh, Greg is um, involved with the California Native Plant Society, among other things, and he's a private contractor down in San Diego. It's a big, thick book. It's expensive, but it has everything you want to know about native gardens uh, from 2016. So it's relatively modern. Um, the same folks have done a smaller book called The Drought-Defying California Garden. Same author, Greg Rubin, and a co-author. Um, skinnier book, much cheaper paperback. Uh, interesting point. Not all California natives are drought tolerant. Some California natives are drought tolerant by dying off. And so you want to make sure you do your research about how the plants work before you put them in your garden and then are upset that your California buckwheat is sort of brown and crunchy looking. Um, California native gardeners kind of like that brown and crunchy look uh, and appreciate having the seeds for birds and, and other folks to come and collect out of their gardens. Finally, the last book is a classic that has been around forever um, since uh, in the 90s, I believe. It's called California Native Plants for the Garden. It's the only one that's not orange right now. Um, all of these are on Amazon. Again, I'll put the list up in the chat in just a moment. And um, again, one of the go-to books that it describes the, the use of native plants in your garden. So why native plants? Two major reasons. The first is you want to have something that's eco-friendly. You want to have something that doesn't fight with the local environment. That is something that you don't have to, uh, to worry about not being able to tolerate the hot days. My camellias really did not like 116 degrees a while back. And the only reason we have them really is they came with the house. We've had them for 20 years and they've been here for 50 years before that. Uh, but they got sunburned. On the other hand, the ceanothus, the salvias, the manzanitas, the um, penstemons, all these native plants that we've put in our yard, happy. They started to bloom again as soon as the heat let up just a little bit. So they're, they're happy to live with even the 115 degree heat. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason is they... Um, require very, very little water for the most part, if you're careful about the ones you pick. Um, there are understory plants, shade plants that require more water than others. So you wanna make sure that you're hip to what the ecosystems are and um, make sure that you put plants that like to live together near each other. Again, redwoods and manzanita, probably not in the same, in the same um, little ecosystem, right? All right, so that is the very barest of introductions to California native plants. I, I wanted to throw it out there, kind of put it in your consciousness uh, and provide folks with a little bit of uh, information so they can um, 
just start thinking about it. If you want to get rid of a lawn or you want to start converting uh, some of your plants to things that will use lower water. Uh, finally, there's um, a couple of resources. I mentioned the California Native Plant Society. Um, and there is also a website called Calflora. That's interesting. It's not letting me put it in the chat. So I will try to work on that. There we go. Uh, that's a lot, but those are the books. And at the bottom is Calflora. Uh, the Calflora website lets you look up the types of plants that work in your zip code, in your neighborhood, and um, will work with the uh, environment that you already have so that you're not battling the ecosystem to put in a tropical plant or some other thing that is invasive. And that's another piece to be aware of. California Native Plant Society uh, has links to invasive plants. Before you put something in your landscape, it's always useful to check. You can Google California invasive name of plant and you'll find out that a lot of the plants they sell at your average hardware store are actually evil. Well, okay, they're not evil, but they, they're very aggressive and they get loose from your garden and they push out the natives. One of the reasons we're having problems with fires is most of the grasses that are there are uh, annual grasses that grow up, die, and then become fuel. And almost all of those grasses are invasive. They're non-native. Uh, somebody put the word horsetails in the uh, chat. If I could go back and draw a line through it, I would. Yes, that's a horrible, nasty invasive. It's like bamboo. Once you have bamboo, you will always have bamboo, and it can get feral. Anyway, native plants, think about it. I really highly recommend native plant life um, because it helps you understand how the plants talk to each other and work with each other. Excellent. Uh, we are a little bit over our time, and by the time we edit ourselves down, we'll be back into the, the right uh, hour-long space. But it's time for us to, to pack it in, unless other folks have questions or comments or concerns, or if somebody, uh, Master Gardeners, if I forgot something, um, let me know. Here's the question, will um, these sessions be continuing in October, November, and December? So that's a very good question. Um, we have been talking about it and thinking about it. As of right now, as Judy Gomez says, definitely we're looking at October to go twice a month. But we're reaching the point where we may have um, satisfied the initial emergency where everybody was suddenly faced with trying to do some gardening in the spring because they were stuck at home, concerned about food shortages, or finally had the time. Uh, and we may change the name up, but stay here in a slightly different format. Well, not a different format, but a different name, um, once or twice a month, that sort of thing. But for October, uh, you can plan on the first and the third Tuesday, the first and the third Tuesday in October. And we'll make some decisions to see how November, December, and the next year uh, fall out. All right? Excellent. Um, it, we are, there was a question about if there will be topics outside of food growing. Yes, we're actually open to um, suggestions. So feel free to come on to the Ask an LA County Master Gardener Facebook page and make suggestions um, or email us, uh, or you can email me, honestly, at gardenpasadena at gmail.com, gardenpasadena at gmail.com. All right, last call. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. We will see you next time in the first Tuesday in October. Uh, Master Gardeners, if you'd stick around for a couple minutes so we can debrief, that would be appreciated. All right, bye now.